on our face. So let's jump right on in here and get started. This is an action packed uh, meeting for this evening. We have an amazing guest speaker on today. Uh, but first, I want to make a few introductions here. Um, our amazing guest speaker is George Roberts. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to uh, talk a, a little bit about who we are and what we do. And uh, George's topic this evening, he will be talking about housing economics, macroeconomics, and finance. Uh, we will have some time for questions for those on the live call. And uh, don't forget, next week, Monday evening, speakers will be Katie Newman and Amanda Cox. They're here in the local Dallas as well. So um, <clears throat> this meeting is not legal or financial advice. So uh, it is simply professional sharing what we do in the apartment investing space. Eagle City uh, hosts here are Nikki Maul and Dr. Sanjeev, and uh, also Asif Kumar and myself. And there will be a, a gift, surprise gift at the end for all those on the live call. We'll do a draw and choose one lucky winner. So stay tuned and we will guarantee to make it well worth your time today. I will go ahead and announce George Roberts, our amazing guest speaker today. Before devoting himself to commercial real estate full-time, George worked as an award-winning data scientist and bioscientist with over 700 citations in the field of genomics microbiology and physiology. Deciding that he didn't look handsome in a lab coat, he turned his attention to the dashing world of entrepreneurship. George repurposed his analytical firepower to make housing economics, macroeconomics, and finance fun and exciting as the data scientist of real estate on his YouTube channel. So go check that one out. George is also a principal at Horizon Multifamily, which sponsors value-add multifamily opportunities in the Southeast for qualified passive investors. In addition to his over 300 units as an active multifamily investor, he is also an avid passive investor in hundreds more. George, take it away. Tell us a little more about yourself. All right. Well, wonderful. I think that was a perfect introduction. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add to it. So I guess we can just jump right into the presentation. And I will say that as investors, we deal with uncertainty on a daily basis. However, if there was ever a time we could say that we were investing in uncertain times, that would be now. I brought a friend with me to help share some wisdom in the midst of all this chaos his name is Sun Tzu, and his message today is, in the midst of chaos, there is opportunity. Now, I also have one more uh, relatively modern character that I'd like to introduce, but unfortunately, he's often late. Now, it can be kind of embarrassing, but oh, oh wait, here he is. Why, it's the data scientist of real estate. And he'll be here today to make sure that I don't go any further than the numbers warrant. <clears throat> now, I've been early among the commentators who let investors know that we're not going to have a housing crash in 2022 or 2023, but that there were many parts of the world that might have a crash. And let's kind of check into those predictions. So the early 2023 headlines were harsh. Australia saw housing prices fall for nine straight months, housing price drop of 8.9%, Canadian prices dropped 13%, and in Toronto, prices were down 22% from the peak. China recorded not 16, but in all 18 months of price declines, and Hong Kong prices dropped 15.6%. 
So now as we check back in the middle of 2023, you can see that all three of these countries have already started to recover. <clears throat> Australia has seen three months of recovery. Canadian home prices have grown by 100K and China's home prices have risen for the first time in 18 months. So as expected, we didn't see the housing price crash, but we did see some pretty decent sized crashes around the world. Mm. Now, throughout this presentation, I'll continue to make many references to single family homes, but rest assured that the two markets of single family homes and multifamily are very closely related. We just simply have much better data for single family homes. And so when I cite single family home statistics, I'll take a moment from time to time to relate that to multifamily. And here, I think this is probably the first opportunity to do that in a very quantitative way. So I've got some statistics here compiled by Stefan Svetkov from Realty Quant. And what he's showing us here is the overvaluation for various markets in commercial multifamily versus the single family home market. You see there's an extraordinary amount of correlation. The main difference here is that you see that there's a little bit of, I'd say, bias towards the housing market. The single family homes, it's a more emotional decision. So it's a little bit more overvalued at this moment. So for the moment, I just want you to focus on that correlation. In a few slides, I'll give you the opportunity to see why evaluation is so important, particularly at the end of an economic or housing cycle, as it appears we may be at. So I've listed here a few of the key factors that govern home prices, including housing undersupply, income to home price ratio, interest rates, equity, and foreclosures. And so without further ado, let's get to the main event, which is the data. So the first thing I wanna do is let you know that we have a major, we have a major housing shortage. And, you know, we average just over about 1.5 million units completed each year. If you add up all of the missing units, let's say add up all of the units below the bar, that'd be about 8 million. Now you'll see in the news, a lot of people will cite 5 million. They're looking at household formation. But I think that in the end, we got to come back around to the fact that this is the amount of housing that our growing country needs just to keep up with natural obsolescence, et cetera. So I think things are possibly in this sense, a little bit worse than what's been reported on the news. And let's see what Sun Tzu has to say. He sees opportunity here. So maybe we shouldn't worry. I think that he was a man who really knew how to seize opportunity. So whether on the battlefield or whether you are an investor, uh, very important characteristic. So somebody that I've studied very closely. Now let's look a little deeper into the housing report. And what you'll see here is that we thought for a while that uh, during the pandemic, wow, we got these permits and starts and they're getting up towards about 1.8 million, maybe 2 million. It looked like we were about to chew through the backlog, but look what happened. Interest rates rose, uncertainty also rose, and these builders sort of pulled back. And in the meantime, we've really only had four months since July 2007 that we've even produced housing units at replacement rate. Now, to be clear, this Census Bureau housing report is taking all units together. So this is single family, this is duplexes, quads, as well as commercial multifamily. You figure you got have some place to live. So again, looking at the number of housing units, it's something that correlates very well with the needs, which is household formation. Now, the second thing I wanted to look at is whether our prices are sustainable. Just because I said that, hey, we're not going to see lower prices anytime soon, and I think probably going to see much higher prices before we see uh, for any further pullbacks, uh, which would probably be many years down the road, that doesn't mean that what we're seeing right now is normal. Normally, we'd see that the home price to median income ratio is between four and five. Okay? It's a very good long run average. Got up to seven during the housing bubble. Wow. <laughs> we crashed straight through that, got almost to eight this time around. So clearly, we cannot maintain housing prices at this level with respect to our median incomes. However, again, that doesn't mean that we're gonna see the housing prices crash 
at some point we'll finally see, I think that our median income ratio is, uh, or actually the ratio is gonna normalize over the years, uh, you know, wages will go up and maybe at some point we're gonna have to see a stagnation in home prices, but that's not until we get more building done. All right, so we talked about three countries so far, and I say the best for last, the good old US of A. So what's been going on over here? Well, we saw interest rates increase faster than they ever have in history. From trough to peak, 4.43%. So what happened in the meantime? Well, home prices, according to Case Schiller, only declined about 2.5%. Now, I'll tell you why I follow Case Schiller, why this is such an important data set, because Case Schiller is making apples to apples comparisons. This is showing the resales of previously sold homes. So when Case Schiller says that the prices are increasing or that they're declining, this is a very, very careful measurement. However, we have a problem here. Because it is so careful, it takes a long time to get that data. And our latest data point comes in from March of this year. And here we are recording this towards the end of June. So I'll show you some other data sets that will help us fill in the gaps and try and figure out what's happening. And I'll just foreshadow this. We'll look at this in detail in a moment. But uh, as you see the interest rates hit peak over here in mid-November, we're seeing that the housing price decline reaches its trough around 45 to 60 days later. And that would be the beginning of this year. All right, so let's look at some of the factors that are supporting home prices, because you might be surprised what's going on. You know, how are we doing so well when we had interest rates rise so fast? Well, construction, as I mentioned, is far beyond historical norms, and that's supporting our prices. And we also have sellers locked into low rates. I mean, why would you move today? Unless your job demands it, it really doesn't make any sense. And that's also supporting uh, our prices. Now, I don't know how you like this little guy. How do you like him? Huh? I think I think he's kind of fun. I kind of like him myself. I think we'll keep him. All right. Okay. Double thumbs up from Herb. Appreciate that. So inventory, like I said, inventory remains low. Let's take a look at that quantitatively. Housing inventory is near uh, historical lows. Now, uh, maybe it was worse towards the beginning of last year, but we really haven't seen a whole lot of recovery. This is not what we would expect. And people just voluntarily keeping their homes off the market and builders not building above our replacement rate means that, well, Inventory is indeed low. Supply side is not doing what we might expect and what we need it to do. All right, now I foreshadowed that we take a look at another data set that would help us fill in the gap. So Case Schiller only brings up to March. Here's a data set from the National Association of Realtors. You can find this at Fred. That's fred.stlouisfed.org. I'd highly recommend getting out there. If you're not a fan of Fred, I think you need to be because this is how you get your hands on the data. When you hear all those talking heads tell you what's going on in real estate, don't believe it. It's so much hype out there. You get the data in your own hands, you're far better off. So we saw a price maximum in June. From there, we saw a 12.7% decline. Now notice this compares to 2.9% for Case Shiller. So what's the difference here? Well, Case Shiller, as I mentioned, is apples to apples comparisons. Here, we're just taking the median sales price of existing homes, okay? So what's going to happen when rates shoot up? Well, those super expensive homes become less affordable. So even though we're not making a perfect apples to apples comparison, again, we're getting, we have a lot more recency in this data. And I think both data sets for that reason are very important. So again, remember, we're seeing two things. We're seeing the prices of homes decline, and we're also seeing a preference for relatively moderately priced homes as we hit this peak in January of 2023, which as I pointed out, is just about, you know, say 45 to 60 days after we reached our rate peak in November, mid-November of last year. And ever since then, we've been coming back really strongly, about 2% per month. So here, as we record this at the end of June, why we're probably halfway back to the peak again. We might only be about 2% from all-time highs. Now, remember, of course, 
I'm speaking here in terms of nominal dollars. And we could try and inflation adjust this, but who really trusts those inflation statistics? So in the end, we, we got to understand, we'll be back to nominal highs, perhaps within a couple of months. And we may be back to real highs uh, shortly thereafter. All right, now let's take a look at more monthly mortgage payments, because again, remember, and I'd like to really underscore this, because if you ask Thomas Sowell, what is the definition of economics? He'll say that it is the study of scarce resources with alternative uses. What better example than housing? With housing, you have single family homes, you've got apartments, you can either rent your single family home or you could be owner occupied. And all these housing units, these are all the housing units we have to deal with essentially. So when housing unit is used for one use, it becomes unusable for others. And this sort of scarcity is driving a lot of what we're seeing. So the new home's monthly mortgage payment has gone up like crazy. You can see that we were between $900 and $1,000 for most of the millennium. And we hardly broke out of that until about, say, 2014. And now all of a sudden, why, we're nearly double. That makes it really hard to buy a home. So what do all those people do? Well, that means less owner-occupied units. It means more tenants. And some of those people, of course, are going to rent apartments. So it's very sad for our country. And as somebody in the building industry, I sure would like to do my patriotic duty to help us burn through the backlog. But in the meantime, it's going to mean a lot of very good times for single-family home uh, owners who are, who are renting. The buy and hold strategy is going to be very good. And for us multifamily people, I know there's a lot of people out there in your uh, Eagle City multifamily audience, uh, they're going to benefit a lot from this. Now, let's take a look at this in, in great detail. So here's the peak. It was at 7.08%. Hit that peak twice, second time in the middle of November. In the meantime, what's happened? Inflation fears have come down. And with that, the duration fears, the fears of these bondholders that, hey, I'm going to get hammered because if the rates go up, my bond price is going to go down. Well, with inflation easing, I think that we have a lot of bondholders that are thinking, hey, maybe that's not the issue anymore. And, uh, you know, again, it's supply and demand. So the more people who want to get these mortgage-backed securities, whether it's uh, MBS or commercial mortgage-backed securities, that's good for rates. And what's good for rates is good for prices. So if you're currently an owner, that's good. If you want to sell, maybe not so good. But again, I think our prices are supported for quite a while. All right. Now, also notice that we do have some rather large historic spreads over the Treasury. So you take the 30-year mortgage versus the 10-year Treasury, and you'll see that we usually have a spread of about 175 basis points. But now, wow. 291 basis points. And let's take a quick look at the historical rate cycles. Now, we know that the Fed's going to hit pause at some point, and they didn't raise at the last meeting. We don't know if this is the pause, the pause, or maybe this is the pause that precedes the pause, but we're close. And if you zoom out, now, I'm not going to claim that I know, hey, we are at the very tippy top of the rate cycle. I can't say that today. But what I can tell you is that if you sort of zoom out and you take a wider view and you're in this game for the right reasons, you're not here to just buy and sell, but you're here to buy and hold, you can say that we are essentially at that tip of the rate cycle, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna see lower rates in six weeks or 12 or even 24. Historically, it has taken several months, about six months, uh, or average, sorry, I should say of 8.7 months from the rate peak to the first decline in rates. Now, again, remember, we also, it's not the Fed that's running the show, it's investors. The Fed can only do open market transactions and try to influence the climate. At the end of the day, if people decide that mortgage-backed securities are a great place to be, rates are coming down. Yeah. Again, remember, it's not likely that it's going to happen for a while. Even if that last meeting really was the top, shortest since 1992 is 5.1 months. So, hey, don't hold your breath. <clears throat> now, we're probably also going to have a recession. Now, all I can tell you today with any certainty is that we are one day closer to it than we were yesterday. 
Can't say whether it's going to come in a month or six months or a year. It might be two. But what happened to home prices during the last six recessions? Well, you'll notice that four out of six times, home prices continued to truck along almost as if nothing happened. We'll see in a moment they slow down, but why they hardly stop. And you look at that 1990-1991 recession and the decline was very minor, 1.9%. 2008, of course, is very anomalous. That's when our housing sector blew up. So of course we saw housing prices decline. That's not the sort of thing that I would expect. The other five out of the last six recessions, probably something more like what we're headed for next. And here is a more quantitative approach. You can just see how quickly things were rising both before as well as during the last six recessions. And now here, this is why valuation matters. Again, this is from my friend and colleague, Stefan Svetkov from Realty Quant. And he showed us, you know, if you take a measurement just before the recession and ask yourself, how overvalued are the markets? If you're in a market that's undervalued or fairly valued, you're going to see that even throughout the recession, your prices are likely to increase. But you have a very different trajectory if you are in one of these overvalued markets. So I'd highly recommend getting his data set. It's 300 bucks and some change. And you can get all of the national data. And he'll do that for a lifetime too. So you are, you're in for good. So remember, again, uh, we may be towards the end of the cycle. Just because valuation hasn't been the most important statistic to follow in the past doesn't mean it won't be in the future. Times are changing. Okay, and again, affordability is unsustainable. You see there are many places where the qualifying income is under the, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I should say that uh, people are just not able to qualify for a home because the median family income is sort of at or near, or in some cases under what it takes to qualify out there in the West. How do you qualify? Why do you think people are moving out? Whereas the rest of the country, it's a little bit more balanced. Places like the Northeast and the Midwest, the median family income is actually higher than the median qualifying income. And so you're seeing that these areas are doing a little bit better in terms of of uh, rent growth right now, because we haven't just seen housing get so completely bid up. And in fact, recently we've seen the Midwest leading in rent gains, not because the Midwest jumped out in front of everyone else, but everybody else is slowing down. So watch out. These are the times to be a little bit more conservative. Focus on your market. We talked a lot about the national real estate market, which of course there is truly no national real estate market. Then now is the time you want to be very careful about your market. And it's also a reminder, though, that, yes, we are experiencing inflation. And although home prices and inflation never do really stay quite in tune, they are reasonably well correlated. And over, say, 10 or 20 years, when you're going through uh, inflationary times, you'll find that home price appreciation tends to at least roughly keep up with inflation. So it's not a bad place to be. Real assets are not a bad place to be when you are in inflationary times. Uh, so, so why aren't we going to have a crash? Here's like 10 other reasons. Uh, we have less product risk than we did. Uh, we don't have all the arms, but also the borrower risk. I mean, these lenders are just much more conservative. So I think what we're going to do, yeah, we have very few foreclosures. But what I'd like to do is, I think we it, don't want to beat a dead horse that we're not going to have uh, a crisis. I think that most people are there. doesn't mean there isn't going to be carnage. Uh, for a year, we've seen higher rates, but a lot of those people that may be in a bridge loan or in some variable rate loan, they may uh, have had a cap, but those caps are wearing off. And so it's not just the people who couldn't get out of the bridge loan. Now you have people who can't get out of their bridge loan. And guess what? That cap's going away because either they didn't purchase it or Maybe it may come for the first year, depending on the type of loan you've got. Boom. There will be some opportunities. So keep your eyes out. Keep your heads up. Make sure that you have your powder dry. Uh, reserves are very highly desirable at a time that uh, you see a lot of people falling by the wayside. So 
we are, again, zooming out a little bit, we are at or near the top of the rate cycle. Once rates begin to drop, I believe prices will begin to rise rapidly again. And I think we're going to see uh, many years of housing prices and rents rising until we work through this backlog. we got to get through this supply side. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your attention. And I'll turn it back over to Herb. I believe, Herb, you've got some questions for me. Yes, thank you so much, George. That is uh, valuable information. Uh, as, and the thing that stood out to me as you were talking, um, it looked like home prices are almost as high as at the highest of last year already this year. So that's, that's uh, it wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. Well, so, you know, I, I, and you know, the more you read the news, the less you would be aware of that. It's right. almost counterintuitive. Uh, there's all these scare headlines these days. I agree. Right. That's what we see. And also, all, all you uh, live, go ahead and post your questions in the chat. I see some coming up. Um, and <clears throat> uh, George, you talked about a little bit about already about how the housing economics affects multifamily. Had a question about that. Um, would you do you want to say any more about that? Well, sure. I think we can kind of hit it again. Again, uh, you you got to live in some sort of a housing unit. It doesn't really matter what. So, whether you're living in multifamily, single family, or you're converting uh, a hotel to multifamily, again, we only have so many units. And so, if people aren't able to buy, which again is increasingly what we're seeing. We've pulled back from the highest rates and the least housing affordability we've seen. But again, we're we're still very near the top. And if people can't buy, they're going to rent. So this inability to buy that single family home right now is going to drive people to become tenants. And it's going to be a great time to be a landlord. It's going to be a great time to be a landlord for quite some time to come. I agree. I, I uh, heard you talking about owners that maybe didn't have a rate cap or had variable rate loans may not be able to keep their property, right? Because the interest go up so high and they're underwater, we say, right? On the on their deal. And so they need to like let go of it, right? If they can't support the payments, the new payments, right? So there I see there may be some deals coming online. There are already, right? And um, do, would you talk to us a little more about that? Well, sure. I mean, you're talking about the uh, types of financing right there. I mean, it gets right to the heart of the importance of choosing the right financing for the job. So if you're going to ask me right now, like, what is the best or worst type of finance for multifamily as current market, I'd say like your variable rates are still very dangerous, right? So, you know, we may believe we're at the top of the rate cycle. And given the size of the U.S. debt and the likelihood of a recession at some point in the near future, we probably are. But it's impossible to know. I don't want one of those variable rates right now, even with a cap. Some people are just being pulled under by the cap. You see a lot of people, they aren't paying a distribution. Why? Because they have to buy the cap. Because if they don't, they might have to go back to their investors and tell them they got a goose egg. And that's not good. So seller financing is always the best deal whenever available. It's nice work if you can get it, and you can get it if you try, but it's not easy to get for the larger buildings. So this is one of the reasons why I am liking some small to medium multifamily, 20, 40, 50 units. I think there are going to be some great opportunities there because you can continue to do your renovations. You don't have to worry about covenants. You can treat it almost as you would like a bridge loan, only without the danger, because nobody's there checking and saying, hey you know, uh, have you got at least 90% occupancy? Right. I agree. I agree The the rate cap insurance costs so much, right? Some of them are over a million dollars, right? To, to secure the cap, right? For the next year or two. And so we have a, uh, uh, Tristan is raising his hand. Go ahead, Tristan, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, hey, George. Um, I, I liked your presentation. It was good. Can you guys hear me all right? Oh, yes. No, not, not very well. Okay. Oh, because um, I have my AirPods in. I'm at the gym, so I don't know if it was good. But, uh, 
um, I have, or uh, you went to, you had one slide about the 100 like metros. Um, there's one of Dallas. I was just wondering if you could go back to that slide maybe. Okay, can you say it again? Which slide was that? Um, it was like 100 metros, um, like the valuation of the homes. Got it. Yes, that was the Realty Quant slide. Let me put that up again. Thank you, George. All right, boom. And I want to say that was only about 20 slides ago. Here it is. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just saw that there was Dallas, and I just was, um, it took me a second to see what I was looking at, but it's interesting. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you called it out because so what Stefan is doing here is he's showing us that nowadays this could be your future if you're in, say, Austin, Phoenix, Tampa, and Dallas. Now, some of these markets have already seen a pretty decent crash. I know Phoenix is not doing so well. Uh, many markets in Idaho, I mean, Idaho has just <laughs> grown like crazy, southern Idaho, and they've also seen some declines already as well. <clears throat> I wasn't sure if you had a like a further question or if you want to you just want a chance to take a look no, at it. I sorry, mean there's a I lot just to take want to look in at, here. Yeah, there's just a lot of information there. I was trying to look at all the cities and stuff. I mean, um, some of the ones that I like, for example, Cincinnati. I I love Cincinnati. I think it's been on the rebound, uh, but not so long that I think everyone's caught on. Uh, I see a lot of Midwestern cities here. And again, whether these cities actually take off or not depends on migration. However, your money might be safer in the Midwest. And so I really like this middle latitudes of our country, places like Cincinnati, Kentucky, East Tennessee. These are places that are not uh, tremendously overvalued. Miami, here's one that I'm staying away from, uh, although I am in Orlando. I don't feel Orlando is quite nearly uh, as bad as Miami. Uh, actually, all of Florida, I'm beginning to stay a little bit away from. Uh, again, looking for those areas where we're not rent constrained. Uh, a lot of these markets, I mean, we can't all move out to the Bay Area. It's it's just nuts. We we can't pay those sorts of rents. And so you see people moving, I think, to the more reasonable areas. Tennessee is continuing to attract uh, just tons of people. And, uh, and again, Florida is still attracting population, uh, particularly to the central portion. All right, thank you for bringing that up. Tristan, was, do you have some more questions on that or comments? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Thanks for going back to it. Yeah, it helped me to understand it better too by bringing it up. And um, remember, it's always available in the recording on our Facebook and our YouTube channel as well. So, um, all right. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, bring up our wheel of names to select one lucky winner for a $10 Starbucks card that will give out on whoever it stops on. Okay, DeLorean, look at you. So uh, this Starbucks card will be emailed to you. All you do is open up your email at the Starbucks, scan it, uh, and you get your drink paid for. So thanks for uh, joining us today. And um, it was very interesting to me to hear about housing, housing in general, George, how you, you talked about home pricing, where the different parts of the country where we might look at investing and um any other comments before we uh close it out for today well you have, you have any uh canned questions herb i do i um <clears throat> uh the best and worst types of finance for Marty family in this current market. I know we talked about that a little bit. And I Yeah, sure. I, so I'll just sort of reiterate like again, the variable rates watch out, but look for seller financing, look for uh fixed financing wherever you can. I think that's the way to go. Good. 
great. That's uh, we really look for assumable loans as well. That's something that we've we've done on our last deal. We had a fixed low fixed rate on the last 128 unit deal that we purchased, and um, it really helps. Makes a big difference on the numbers. So yeah, yes, indeed. It's sometimes hard to assume those. Uh, sometimes a little resistance to uh, letting the new owner take that rate, but when you can, it's a good, good thing. Oh, absolutely. That's right. All righty. Well, uh, DeLorean, look for your uh, gift on your email. And um, this was amazing content, George. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close it out for today and come join us next week. All right. Thank well, you, thank Lord. you so much for the opportunity, Herb. It was a great, uh, great time. Thank you, you as well. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, George. Thanks, Herb. My Good pleasure. Day. Bye, Edward. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.